I'd like to introduce our presenter, Greg Hollows, who will provide an introductory look at specifying imaging lenses. Greg is the Vice President of the Imaging Business Unit here at Edmund Optics and has 20 years of experience in imaging and vision technology. He began his career at Edmund Optics as an engineering technician and quickly moved up, now leading everything pertaining to imaging and vision for Edmund Optics. As a thought leader in the industry, Greg has authored numerous articles throughout his career on imaging technology and is a sought-after speaker on optical technology. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Greg. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to spend a bit of time here uh, in part one of this webinar going through uh, some of the best practices and how to specify an imaging lens. And we want to keep it at, at a level that is uh, straightforward and something that can get you up and rolling. In part two later on, uh, you will be able to hear more about how to discern between different lenses that are close in capabilities and features, or when you go through like a lens calculator or something like that where you would see multiple options become available and might not be able to discern uh, directly which one is the best choice for what you're doing. What we want to do is get uh, started in understanding uh, in this first part of the webinar, specifying lenses and best practice to maximize system performance. We're going to start off by looking at how we actually go through and do simplified capabilities for selecting lenses. And this is something uh, usually like a lens calculator or some formulas that you can use. And then we're going to look at once a lens is chosen, the best ways and the most practical ways to maximize that performance. Because even if you get the right product to go with your camera and that's going to fit the application overall, there are many things that you can do and that it's good for you to understand about how to actually get things to work correctly. Some of that comes a little bit before the specification and some of it's after. We're going to roll into that. And then in part two, we're going to understand the real-world implications of the lens performance. And it's going to give you an idea and an understanding of lens performance curves, the data that goes with it. And really what you should walk away with is the ability to understand this. Uh, there's a lot of optical design information that's contained in there, but it's really understanding which questions you have to ask how to get comfortable with understanding the data that's there, and how to make the best selection that's for you. And we're going to look at some real-world examples of tying lens performance that's on these sheets with the products to actually some images uh, showing how well that performance all connects together. What I really want to walk through, though, is give you an example here up front, uh, just to give you an idea of the different levels of lens capability that are out there and how they can work on a system. And this is some uh, scenario here where you might go through a lens calculator, do some uh, some work by hand to say, I've chosen a lens of a certain type. And what we have in this example here is we've got two images of the same set of objects. These are cap skirts on pharmaceutical bottles. And on the tops of these bottles, there's 2D barcodes on them or 2D data matrices. And they contain all sorts of good information about date lot code information, what sort of materials inside or uh, medications inside that's uh, going to be used on you or, or maybe one of your family members. And what, what happens here is that you want to be able to read this information and validate that all of that is clearly written on there so there's no ambiguity about the medication that's in the bottle when it's being packaged. Now, putting an imaging system together here, we're using two lenses that have basically identical specifications on the same sensor and on the same lighting system. So you should get two very, very similar images. But what we're going to see that even though the focal lengths are the same, the F numbers are the same, and the package size is very, very similar, that we actually get different levels of performance. If you look at the red outlines here at these pharmaceutical bottles, both on the left and the right, the middle one in each of those images, we see a very clear, crisp image. We can see the details of these 2D data matrices highlighted very, very well. And the data is easily read by either one of those systems with the software. The thing is, is that imaging lenses don't always have the same performance across the entire field of view. Some things might be designed to uh, look at a great distance at a parking lot, let's say, to, to look at uh, our car's presence or absence or things like that. And other lenses are designed to look up close and look at specific details of something like this with the pharmaceutical bottles. And we'll see this as we move out to the edge of the image to look at how well those pharmaceutical bottles on the right, those 2D data matrices, look. And when we zero in on those two areas, we'll see two very big differences in the overall performance of these two lenses that are chosen. Again, they have the same specifications with them, but the performance is greatly, greatly different. To give you a feel for what you're seeing here, on the left-hand side, you're seeing a contrast level of about 50-55%, and on the right, we're seeing about 15% contrast that's created here. We often think, when we're dealing with imaging systems, just about the resolution of the sensor. But we always have to think about contrast and the level of performance that's created. That's how well, at a given detail size, I can actually separate my black and white information, or in this case, our shades of gray. Now, both of these systems could theoretically work, but the one on the left is going to give a much higher level of repeatability 
and capability to the overall applications being done. Through both parts of our seminar today, we're going to walk through and see how to, to make these choices. So we're going to start at the beginning again and kind of work our way through how we would make a simple choice and then see all the details that go into place about making sure that is the absolute correct choice, not just a focal length and an F number, but actually how well the lens performs. So let's get started, just keeping it at a very simple, straightforward level. There's different ways to specify lenses, but we can get down to some of the very easy ones to do. We can do hand calculations, and this is the type of thing that uh, uh, has been done for a very long time. There are formulas available that have different information in them, talking about the distance away uh, from the, the sensor you need to be, the distance to the object, the actual height of what you want to see, or the size of the object you want to see. It can be put in terms of focal length, uh, and you can start sorting out and solve for different inf information. Now, this is uh, in many ways a great learning tool to understand how things work and change, but it is also kind of clunky and takes a bit of time, and it can be inaccurate because it's taking in certain fundamental assumptions that are not part of the designs themselves. The next thing that can be done is you can use a lens calculator. Uh, there's many of them out there. There's an example up on the screen here right now where you can put in a certain amount of information. How far does my system need to be away from the object I'm looking at, the working distance? How big is the field of view? How big is the object I want to see? And you can put in inputs like the sensor size that's going to be used to help make these calculations. It's a very similar set of calculations usually to the hand-cranked uh, information that we saw prior. It gives you an output, and you'll see an example here. We put a, a basic one in. We're looking at a working distance of 250 millimeters away, about 10 inches. And we have a field of view or an object we want to see. It's 100 millimeters or about 4 inches in size. With that, you'll see in the, the right-hand part of the two images that are there, you, there's a uh, uh, output that's given showing a certain lens uh, of a type that could be used, but you'll notice at the very top in the middle it says one of nine. There's up to nine selections under this scenario with this calculator that could be used. Some of them might be slightly closer or further away from what you wanted, but it's giving you a whole range of things. What we want to do uh, ultimately through the two parts of this webinar is see how to discern the differences between them and make the best decisions overall. Let's walk through and do a specific example of things and see where some of the limitations come into play because there are definitely pros and cons with the calculators. So we want to use one here. We're uh, using a camera that has a 1 over 1 8-inch sensor. This is very typical uh, that is uh, used in the market today. It's usually around 2 megapixels. This sensor it gets a lot of data across. And we're looking to look at a field of view in this case of 200 millimeters, 8 inches wide, at only 100 millimeters away or 4 inches away from the optical system. So it's a very short working distance, but very wide field of view application. It's very common to uh, try and fit things into small package sizes to be very, very close, but there are limitations. Uh, we chose this example to show the limitations of what you can get in a calculator. It's not to say that the calculator is good or bad, just saying that there are things that have to be taken into account, and the calculator may not be enough. Go ahead and we plug those numbers in, whether it's into the basic formula or to one of the calculators. We get a number somewhere between three or four millimeters for the focal length. And basically the way these work is they're just taking the angular field of view of the triangle that's created from the, uh, the front point of that 100 millimeters out to the edges of the object and doing a calculation which can give you a focal length uh, out of the end of that information. What the formulas actually give you is a focal length, in this case, of 3.48 millimeters. It's a fairly short focal length lens, but this isn't taking everything into account. We can have some problems. After you purchase that sort of product and bring it in, a 3.5 millimeter lens, which appears very, very close, what you find and you plug it into your system, if it's not working as expected. In this scenario, you actually get a field of view that's significantly larger than the one you wanted, which was a 200 millimeter focal length. We want to go through and see what some of the calculations, uh, the assumptions that are made by those calculators and what some of those limitations are. They do things in a very simple matter. They're not taking into account that there are multiple elements that are being used, and this creates a certain size. They're usually doing a thin lens calculation. They're saying from some plane, some single surface, I can draw that triangle out that I mentioned in the last slide and get that information for what those angles are. A lens is much more complex than that, and especially ones that are short focal length. They have quite a few elements in them to get the performance that's usually required for resolution. And it means that that calculation of saying, here's this plane, this one spot where I can do that calculation from, is not exactly the front of the lens. So we get some mischaracterization there. The second part is that lens calculators, not all, but by and large, don't take into account things like distortion. Distortion is basically a misplacement of information, and a, it's a bending of how big the image should really be against the actual focal length. And in some cases, this can be 10, 15, even 20, or 30 percent which changes your field of view by that much or more. 
And that can create significant problems when you're trying to do these calculations. The other part of it is, too, is they usually don't take into account the lens performance of, of the system and how well it performs everywhere across the board. They're just doing this straightforward calculation. We're going to see at the end of part two how that can really come into play, and you get different levels of performance depending on how the lens was designed. I'm going to stay away from those details in part one here, but know that that's actually one of the most significant things that can come into play when just using the calculator is actually getting one that's commensurate both with your application and the sensor that you're choosing to use. The inaccuracies of calculators from the previous example came up with a focal length that's different than what we actually require due to the distortion. The correct lens actually in this application is a four and a half millimeter lens. Now to you and I, one millimeter of focal length difference doesn't seem like very much, but it is a completely different lens in the solution, and it's about 30% different in the actual focal length that's being used. So it is a significant change to the product, and it's going to change the actual things that you need to do, and you're going to find in this case here, you get the right working distance, you get the right field of view, and it's actually in a smaller and less expensive package, which is very beneficial at the end of the day. The other things that you want to think about, you know, when we're looking at lens calculators, um, you have to say, are, are they using basic equations or not? Um, for things that are very far away and are looking at small fields of view, the basic equations hold pretty well. When you start getting up close, as, as is the case in many machine vision applications, that can be a little bit difficult. And they taking only in account that angular field of view, or are they basically saying from the front surface of the lens or the metal, I'm just doing a apex sort of uh, approach with the triangle that's created from that to what I'm looking at, or they take into account the actual design parameters and saying, is that angular field of view that's being calculated from somewhere within the lens? In some cases, it's sometimes in front of the lens, like a telephoto lens, it might actually be a little bit different. So as you change working distances, the angular fields of view can actually change slightly, which will affect the calculations. What we want to do is shift over a little bit here now. Let's just make the assumption that we've chosen our lens, we've gotten the right detail and all that. We want to look at the, the rest of this part of uh, section one of the webinar about how to maximize that performance. And some of the things that are going to be in here are going to be things that you want to think about pre-choosing the lens, and some of the things are about actually installing them in the application. We've got five areas here that we want to look at that uh, kind of bring together how to maximize the performance to the system. Start off with the first one. You really want to allow room for the imaging system to be the size that it wants to be. In many cases, it's typical to build a machine or an enclosure or something like that around everything else that's going on and then pick your camera and lens last. And usually what that leads to is an artificial reduction of the, the envelope that you can fit in. If you want to maximize performance, especially in the era that we're in now where high resolution sensors just aren't the extreme examples, but they are the mainstream. They are you know, uh, if you go back a few years, five megapixel sensors were just becoming normal for some applications. Now they're the centerpiece of most applications. We're seeing resolutions, 12 megapixel, 16 megapixel, 50 and 100 megapixel sensors are actively being worked on and coming to market shortly. You're going to want enough room for the optics to grow to the size that they need to be, have the right working distances to maximize performance because you're going to need some forgiveness in those systems up front. So if you're thinking about high-resolution imaging, which I think almost everybody is now, for machine vision especially, you want to give room for the optics to fit and work. Uh, they really want to grow to a certain size to maximize performance. Other things that come into play, too, if you're getting into applications, we're going to use all that resolution to do uh, very, very tight measurements or get fine detail out of the information. A lot of times those lenses want to get large, especially when we talk about measurement applications. If you want to do a very, very tight measurement on something that's, say, 100 millimeters or 4 inches in size, you might need a lens that's almost 170 millimeters across. That lens is going to be almost a foot long, and it's going to need a working distance of 1 to 2 feet beyond that. That's not something that's easily changed or adjusted for your system. It's something that you're going to have to take into account beforehand. So you want to be thinking about these things up front. So you always want to give space and room for your system. Taking out a step beyond that, illuminating the objects that you want to see can be very complicated and complex, especially as the objects get larger. You need to give space in the system for the lighting to be able to fit as well. And while this webinar is not very much about lighting, you see how lighting comes up a couple of times. You have to give room for that geometry that's necessary to be able to pull out the details and enhance the contrast you need to be able to see the information. You can pick the best sensor with the highest resolution. You can pick the best lens for reproducing contrast possible. But if you're not able to light your object well to actually get the contrast to come off of the object at a high level, it's all going to be for naught, all those other selections you made. So you have to allow for room for this as well. Second tip that we have for you, 
you really want to get into thinking about the right working distance to field of view ratio. This ties a little bit back to the first one, but what we've found over time is that getting the right ratio of the object size to how far you're going to be away goes a long way to giving you the highest performing system at the most budgetary conscious price. Um, it's easy to say that we have all these different focal lengths that give us angular fields of view that are from narrow to wide and say, I can just get closer and expect good performance. But we're going to look at the example down here at the bottom of the slide. And we're going to see we have two fields of view that are given, 100 millimeters each. So same size field of view using the same sensor in both examples here. But we actually have lens design layout showed for a 35 millimeter lens and for a four and a half millimeter lens. You'll notice as you look at the 35 millimeter lens, it's much further away. That's because the focal length is, is significantly longer and the angular field of view is narrower because of that long focal length. But the other thing to notice is that the obliqueness of the rays that are coming in, each one of those different colors is a cone of light with different rays in it. As those rays approach that front lens and they hit that front element, there's not as much bending of the light that has to go on. If we look down at the four and a half millimeter at the bottom, those oblique rays have to be bent significantly going through that lens system to get them back to a point where we can actually get them on the center, uh, the sensor and image them. What happens with all that excessive bending is you introduce a number of different issues from a physics point of view that degrade the image quality of the lens. And we end up having to make trade-offs of performance, uh, illumination levels across the, the sensor. We're going to see that in the second part in detail. You start introducing uh, a bit more distortion. You're going to find distortion and resolution fight each other. Uh, for uh, dominance, like if you want to get distortion down, your resolution has to give. If you want your resolution up, you usually get more distortion. All these things start coming into play. What you end up with is a lower performing lens that can be more expensive than the one that's on the top. So giving yourself that room and that space to make things work from a working distance to field of view ratio is really critical. We recommend using a field of view to working distance ratio of about uh, uh, two to one working distance to field of view. So if your field of view in this case is 100 millimeters in size, you really want a working distance of 200 to 400 millimeters to maximize the performance of the lens and keep your costs in line and in check. What you may find is you might have to spend three, four, or five times as much to go to an extreme working distance below one to one, and you still may not get the performance of the two to one or four to one ratio range that we're talking about. The next tip that we have for you is considering the right illumination for your system. Uh, illumination goes a long way, and we have an example here, and uh, the thing we want you to take away from this example is not that this type of illumination we're showing here is the best illumination in all circumstances. What we want to show is two different types of illumination compared to each other in this particular requirement for this application and see that there is a big difference. In this example here, we're looking at a metal part. Uh, it's a post with a screw thread in the end of it, and it's rounded around the edges. So we have it illuminated with a backlight. We're trying to create a silhouetted, silhouetted image. We want to see uh, maybe chips or scratches or things that are around the edge. You'll notice on the threading there, there's a small uh, particulate that is sticking off the side that's uh, light gray. You'll also notice if you look at all the edges of this, whether it's in the threading or the main part of the rod, there's this lighter area uh, going towards the edge. And we, this is referred to as the fuzzy edge. The reason for that is if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, you'll see the yellow area, that's the backlight, and it's usually got a diffuser on that to create an even illumination profile. With that even illumination profile, we've got this diffuse light coming off, and you can see at any given point the light is going out in a number of different directions. As it moves to our part, which is shown here in blue, you can see a couple of those arrows are going towards the edges. Looking at metallic parts or anything that has any specularity to it or reflectiveness to it, you're going to get some amount of that light that was coming from a spot outside of the field of view in this case that's hitting that edge and it's being scattered back towards the camera and thus we get this softer edge. Using a different type of illumination in this scenario where we actually have directional illumination, in this case it's a telecentric illumination, we have all the rays running parallel to each other. We get a nice silhouetted image. You can see a distinct difference here. If we're looking for edge transitions, unlike the first image where it's rolling off, we get a nice clear distinctive change to that edge. Also notice the, uh, the, that uh, particulate that was there that's on the thread is nice and dark now. What I want to do next is show you a side by side so you can actually see that information next to each other and see the difference that is there. Again, it's not to say one illumination is better than another. There are definite examples where that sort of telecentric illumination is a problem. It's got limited size to it. It is very directionally hard to control in some cases. It needs to be perfectly aligned to your, your imaging system, to your lens system, your sensor to get good performance like this. The backlight gives you 
lots of range of freedom and flexibility and still gives you a reasonable silhouetted image, especially on objects that are opaque or don't have a high reflectivity to their edges. So it's all about using the right thing at the right time. The big takeaway here is how can I enhance and improve my contrast? What I want to take you to next is another area of illumination. This could take us to our last two tips that are actually tied together. And when we start talking about ways you can bring about greater performance, this is one of these aspects where you can actually bring the performance of your system up by 20 or 30% by just making some subtle adjustments. What we want to start with is understanding how we produce small details on an object, uh, from an object onto our sensor. And from a physics point of view, there's an upper limitation. It's related to three things. There's a formula that's used. It has a constant in it. It has the F number of the, the lens and has the wavelength of light. The real big takeaway here is that the smaller the F number and the shorter the wavelength of light, the smaller the detail we can produce by the laws of physics. And that's seen in this chart here. You'll see the red, green, blue, and violet wavelengths that are listed here. We have the wavelengths listed next to them for the specific ones that match up. And you'll see different F numbers going across. And by that formula, we're able to show the spot sizes in microns that are created. What you don't need to do is understand or take away all of the details that are actually on this. Just understand the directionality of it. You can see as the F numbers are smaller and the wavelengths are shorter, we go to smaller spots. So as we're heading towards the lower left corner, which is the smallest F number and the shortest wavelength, the detail I can recreate gets to be smaller. We're going to see this being a problem in our last uh, couple of slides here for this first part that when you want better depth of field, you actually need a larger F number, not a smaller F number. So they fight each other. We're going to show an example of that in a few slides. But right now, I just want to focus on resolution at best focus. Here's an example of these images. On the left, we have red light, the 660 that's up in the chart there. And we have a lens that is maximizing its performance. Uh, it's, it's put in a position where physics is the only thing that's controlling the absolute level of performance here. We have a target on here that has lines that are getting narrower as we go towards the center. So we're seeing higher and higher resolution, which is smaller and smaller detail that needs to be reproduced on the sensor. The red light here, we put a, a blue circle around where the spot is that everything blurred together because of the physics-related uh, information that we show in the table above. And then right next to it, we changed that backlight to being a blue backlight. We didn't change the lens, didn't change the sensor. All we did was change the illumination. Look at the same target, you can see inside that same blue circle, we can see much more detail in the system. That's nearly a 30% pickup in actual resolution that can be seen there. And if you look closely, even at the lower resolutions where the lines are wider, the blacks are much blacker, the whites are much whiter. We're picking up more contrast everywhere in the system. So choosing the right wavelength of light, shorter wavelengths, usually going from red to the greens to the blues, is very, very helpful for putting an application together. You'll see violet on there as well. We use that as an example. Violet illumination usually has some other problems with the lens design where you might lose performance, and it's not as readily available on the market. So things at 470 LEDs are generally uh, one of the best choices you can make for performance enhancement. Here's an example here of those spots in the blue, green, red, and then we have white representing the IR. You can see them going on to what's an example sensor here. And they are showing the, the grid that is here uh, and how they overlap and blur information together just by choosing the different wavelengths. The last point I want to make is actually getting into that F number issue and how it connects back to depth of field and best resolution. Remember I said before that having a low F number and a low wavelength of light is highly beneficial for resolution. That's the maximized performance. Having a high F number gives us better depth of field. And the example that we have here, we're showing two F numbers, a low F number of 2.8 and a high F number of F8. And the way you want to think about everything is light works as a cone going off the object for best focus and propagating through towards the lens. What we have here is an example of objects moving further and further away from best focus, so they're moving up this cone. When you have a low F number, you have a larger cone. Thus, those objects take up less space in the cone, and there's more things around them to blur into. In the F8 example, the cone is narrower, so as those objects move further and further away, they actually take up the full cone so you can still discern them and see them. When we combine these two things together, Really, the takeaway is, is that you need low F numbers to get the performance, which is shown on the bottom image with the spot sizes, but you get bad depth of field or lower depth of field. With a high F number, we get great depth of field. We get better information at different distances away, but you can see we get more blurring at best focus. The one big thing you have to remember in all this is that as resolutions go higher and pixels get smaller, is that there's going to have to be trade-offs. If you want the maximum performance, you're probably going to have to give up some depth of field at the end of the day to make things go. And you have to be prepared for this because it's a physics issue, not necessarily a lens design issue. 
So we want to bring it all together and kind of uh, get the conclusion going here and then tie it over to our second part of the presentation. First big takeaways, lens calculators are wonderful tools to get the process started. They tell you all kinds of good information. They get you in the right area to make the decisions you need to do. Just understand they do have limitations. They're not perfect. Uh, and there's, there's lots of issues that can come into play with them, especially with systems with shorter working distances and wider fields of view. That's because of the distortion aspect in that there's not a lot of distance for those calculations. Those errors really become big in the system. Next thing is you want to maximize your lens performance while meeting budgetary constraints. You really need to employ flexibility into your thinking. You might have to go to a longer working distance. You might have to adjust the space that you're in. You have to think about things like that. Lenses in and of themselves to get the performance up need more degrees of freedom in them. You need more elements in the system. You need more glass types. That means that the lens system itself wants to grow in size. Driving things towards smaller lenses for compactness is great, but in a lot of cases, you might trade off performance in that lens system if you're not careful. Proper lighting, both the geometry and wavelength, go a long way to enhancing your lens performance. And it's one of the biggest things you can do is choosing the right wavelength of light to actually get a nice kick up in performance in the system. And trade-offs between resolution and depth of field might be required at the end of the day. You can't have infinite depth of field and the highest level of resolution all at the same time. It's just impossible by physics. Last thing we want to talk about as we transition into part two is that you, know, you, you go through, you do the calculations, you do your research, you're going to find there's probably a lot of products that feel like they could actually serve the purpose that you need. What you're going to find, though, is that the way they were designed and what they were designed for is going to have a huge impact in the actual performance that you're going to get out of them. Understanding lens design curves and data sheets is a big part of making things happen for what you're going to do, and they can really tell you what sort of performance you get, and that's what we're going to see in part two. Thank you very much for your time here as listening to part one today. Thank you, Greg. Uh, please note we still have a team of expert engineers answering the questions you've submitted in Q&A. We'll continue to answer your questions after this portion of the webinar has concluded. Additionally, we answer many of your questions during the webinar. It looks like we have a minute to uh, address a few common and notable ones that came up and are worth sharing. Um, so Greg, let me just ask, is it possible to make a more accurate lens calculator that makes less assumptions? Uh, it is possible, but what you end up with is um, a lot of detail that has to go in there, uh, very, very cumbersome calculations. And in many cases, it might actually require the user to put in more information they might have available. So they, um, while you can make something that's perfect, you're basically reproducing lens design software uh, and then maintaining it and keeping it uh, to the level of accuracy that's required can be difficult and uh, time consuming. Great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, that covers it for part one of the webinar. We appreciate you all joining us. Just a reminder, a link to today's recording will be sent to all participants shortly. You can also reach us via email, the Edmund Optics 1-800 number, or through the live chat feature on our website.